We are going to explore features and visualize some features and uh, eventually we'll uh, come to building a predictive model. Um, and uh, I will give a quick overview to a new tool that came out. Uh, it's called Azure Machine Learning Studio. It's neat. You guys probably uh, should uh, start playing around with that. Uh, you'll find it really useful. Um, so the goal today is uh, introduce, uh, for those of you who have not played around with R, uh, we are going to show some graphics capabilities of R. And not just the graphics capabilities, we are also going to show uh, how do you really analyze and slice and dice data and try to understand um, what, uh, what should be the thinking behind when you are uh, trying to build a predictive model. And so initially I will be uh, doing only the base graphics, uh, the, gra uh, the package that ships with base R, but eventually I will show some of the cap uh, capabilities of ggplot2 uh, and give some examples there. So as I said, I think uh, the goal of the talk is to give uh, an idea of the higher level thinking process that explains how to visualize the data, how to understand your features. I think uh, uh, based on my own experience, what happens is that most people, once uh, they have the data set and they know certain algorithm, what they will do is just they will take the data set and just give it to the algorithm without really uh, doing their due diligence. What, uh, what can the uh, algorithm really do? Does all the data need to go in there to the algorithm or not? So, so, do, uh, so I will uh, go through that thinking process and we'll see um, how, how it goes. And uh, usually, so this is the agenda uh, today. Um, we're going to start with uh, some sample data sets. Most, you know, some of you may be familiar with this IRS and motor cars data set. Uh, we will uh, go to Titanic data sets and when we get there, I will explain what the data set looks like. And then we will do some visualization with ggplot2. And if, uh, if we have time, um, uh, I will try to build a predictive model right in front. Otherwise, I have this R code and then the outputs and everything. And then we'll see uh, how it looks like. And so the slide deck is going to be completely reproducible. If you go and take uh, the sli slides and start uh, copying and pasting code from the slides, it should work. So I have. I have the way I have built this uh, slide deck is that I would write something, take the output, paste the code. So I think it should should be working in most cases. And then I will show this uh, neat tool called Azure Machine Learning Studio. Again, it's it's very useful because uh, the uh, the great thing about uh, machine learning as a service is that uh, you don't have to worry about. Not everybody has a machine with uh, 32 gig of uh, 64 gig of compute. Uh, and then uh, once you have um, even if you have one of those machines. What if you want to do another experiment? What if you want to do Poisson regression, regression and rigid regression and lasso at the same time? How are you going to do it? Because you have only one machine. But when you have a service out there, you can create as many experiments and then uh, the service will actually take care, take care of giving you the machine. So, uh, and then it's going to be a very brief and short tutorial because we have a lot of slides and let's see how, how it goes. So first we'll go to uh, the visualization aspect of things. Uh, so usually this session is, uh, when I conduct this, it's conducted in very interactively. I will show the code, and then uh, everybody will copy, and then they'll type in their IDE. But given we have only one and a half hour, I think this is about three hours worth of work uh, if I do it interactively. But I have to really skim through it. But it shouldn't really impact your understanding of things. If you, if you um, go back and um, if you look at it, uh, it will make sense. And when you go back and if you review it, I think it, sh it should, um, the, you should be able to connect the dots. Um, okay, so I think this is done. So, so there's a uh, saying there, uh, data beats algorithm. Um, and uh, which I tend to agree, right? So if you have more data, uh, even your, a simple algorithm should work. But there are some caveats there. Um, if you have, depending upon how much data you have, right? So eventually the the returns from data they are going to diminish, and also data quality and variety matters, right? So if you're if you're training um, a search algorithm, a search ranking algorithm, and the data that's going in it has a lot of, lot of bots, right? So it's, it has a lot of automated traffic. 
And if you train your uh, ranking algorithm used based on uh, those bots, and they can be scraping your website, um, uh, your search engine, and uh, they're not even clicking on anything, right? So they're just scraping the pages. Or sometimes uh, it's some SEO company, and then they're clicking and uh, going to next page and next page and next page to see where is their client landing on the ranking, right? So, so those are not typical. Uh, those are not the typical behaviors, and you don't want to optimize your search engine for those behaviors. So how do you know um, how, how to train your algorithm, right? So, so you have to really worry about the quality of the data, and data quality is a big issue. Wherever there is data, you, data quality is the biggest, the biggest issue that you could have. Uh, and of, of course, variety, right? So if you are building a model that should work for multiple markets, and you have only data for US market, does it make sense? It may or may not work, but definitely you want to have all the all the possible varieties in your data set. And uh, your decent, a decent performing uh, learning algorithm is still needed. You cannot just uh, just have a very dumb algorithm with, with no due diligence. So it's still needed. And of course, most importantly, you should be extracting the useful features out of data. Uh, if, uh, you stick everything into uh, into the algorithm. Sure, the algorithm will do a decent job, but your performance <coughs> algorithm performance is going to be great, right? So, perhaps only 10 features are important. You are giving the algorithm 1,000 features. So eventually, many algorithms they will figure out which ones are important. But it's it's not uh, the right way to do things. Okay, so just we are just ri uh, jumping right into uh, uh, looking at the visualization, right? So. So usually when I, when I do uh, visualization, the first thing that I do is um, I would look at the data set. I would eyeball the data set. Um, maybe first couple of rows, um, maybe one first thousand rows. I would look at the data set and try to understand what is it that the data has. So this is a data set. I forgot to actually copy and paste the, the first few rows here. So what this is doing is, um, this data ships with the base R package. If you install R, Iris dataset is going to be there. And uh, if you want to get more um, details on what this data set is, you can go to UCI Machine Learning Repository, and it has all the details on this data set. So what this data set is, the, um, it has a certain uh, few columns that uh, describe each of the uh, different uh, parameters about uh, different species of lover. So first uh, parameters uh, is probably uh, sepal length and petal length and sepal width and petal width. So this this, this is uh, the four columns, which are the predictors. And the last uh, column uh, is, uh, is the class. And when I load this data, so the first thing is data iris. It just uh, loads that data into memory. The second uh, command, head of iris, it actually gives you first few rows. Uh, and, um, and you will see that. I think uh, um, I didn't paste it here, but in a later example, I will use that. And the third thing, it's uh, OK. And the third command is, usually when you have some numeric predictors, what you would want to do is you would want to see really what are the what are the ranges of values. So if I give you a data set that has uh, some ages um, and weights of uh, some uh, male and female patients, right? So what you would want to do is you would want to uh, create a box plot and look at both categories. So you can create a box plot that has the whole population, both in male and female. But you you should really look at um, the the heights and weights segmented by the gender, because gender is a uh, it's it's a useful segment here, right? So in this case, we are looking at uh, three species. So species is a class, and we have uh, three uh, species here: Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. And um, it it shows you what, how the values are varying here. So the first is uh, you can uh, you can call it the minimum value, right? So this is the minimum value. The top line is the 
uh, maximum value. Uh, I don't want to be precise here. I think it's uh, it's 1.5 of the interquartile range on the bottom and the top, but I don't want to get there. Let's think of this as as the as the minimum and the maximum. And the dark line in the bit middle it shows the median. So this is the most common or the right in the middle value. And so you have a first species and second species and third species. And uh, I was able to get this visualization just with the simple command. I say, uh, I, what I said was, I want to plot the sepal length. I want a uh, box plot of sepal length for all species. And data is iris. I'm telling it the data is iris. And then name actually gives it uh, the title. And then the X label is species. And Y label is sepal length. And it's fairly simple. So uh, what, uh, what insights, if any, can we draw from this box plot? Any? Any thoughts here? So, yeah. so uh, let me ask you this. So if, if you, what would be the two, uh, two kinds that will be difficult to distinguish if you have to distinguish between them based on only the sepal length, right? The last two? The last two, right? Uh, because uh, if you see, this uh, Setosa has the so this is uh, uh, the minimum, the, uh, the 25th percentile, the 50th percentile, and 75th percentile, right? So most of the values in Sidosa really lie under 5.5, right? So really, if uh, if you have any um, any value that's six, uh, it's most likely not Sidosa, right? But if a, there is a value that's six or 6.5, then you can actually confuse between the the next two because their the length values are pretty close to each other, and th this will become more clear. I think it, uh, if you're looking at it for the first time, I think it will take some kind of uh, training or adaptation. But really, what's happening is that if you're if you're trying to distinguish between these two, um, uh, any of these classes, it's it's going to be difficult to distinguish between the last two classes um, versus. Uh, if you have to distinguish between the first class and the last class, because if you look at the uh, Setosa, the maximum value is around six, and Virginica, the minimum value is around six. So I think you can really define a very, really dumb classifier, a rule-based classifier. If length is less than, uh, and if you know that these are the only two classes in your data sets, you can really just say if length is six, uh, less than 6.0, it's a dosa, otherwise it's Virginica, and it's it's going to be a, a good machine learning algorithm in this case. It's just a basic rule-based algorithm. Okay? And we can start getting fancy. If I say notch equals true, uh, it draws these notch, notch, you know, notches there, and the rest of the arguments are the same. And what notch means is that it's uh, it's giving you, I believe it's 95% confidence around median, and it gives you this confidence that most of the time the median is going to lie in this boundary. So it gives you some additional insight into what uh, what is the most likely value of the median there. And uh, this is just uh, some something that is nice to know, right? So you can add colors. And um, in notch equals true, I just added blue, green, and red. It, it's usually uh, good to, for visualization purposes. Okay. Okay, so how do you save plots? You can save plots in many different formats uh, listed in the, uh, in the table on the left. And really, the, uh, the way you um, save a plot is you start with uh, the first line, uh, PDF. If it, you want to store that as a PDF, if it's PNG, you do it uh, in a PNG format or JPEG or whatever. And then you draw, the, uh, draw that plot that you're trying to draw. And then, um, just like you would cl close a programming handle uh, after you have read the stream, you would say dev dot off, and then it will be uh, it will be saved. Okay, and believe me, it will be you know, in whatever directory you are in. You can just experiment with this, and it's, it should work. Uh, okay, so so we can we can look at the numeric values in in a box plot fashion, right? And what box plot does is it gives you a range of the values. It gives you it gives you an idea of what the values, what the different values are. 
But we can also have uh, histograms and density, density plots. I think histograms is, uh, it's, uh, uh, it should be very familiar with everybody, uh, uh, to everybody. Uh, so you are getting uh, some buckets there. And uh, if you look at the syntax here, uh, what I'm saying is, so this is another data, uh, data sets of column motor cars, data set. And uh, uh, what I'm doing is, I'm plotting the miles per gallon. So this is, uh, this, so this is a bunch of cars that have different mileages. And you have uh, cars ranging from 10 miles per gallon to 30 miles per gallon, and I think even 35 miles per gallon. And you can, uh, you can see uh, that um, most of the cars are uh, around 15 miles per gallon. I think this is an older data set uh, from good old 90s and 80s, I guess, because uh, I, I don't think uh, if you draw a histogram of all the of the um, mileages of uh, the current cars that are currently in the market, I think it should have shifted towards 25-ish, right? So now we have smaller cars and more gas-efficient cars. But what this shows is, I mean, within a single command again, right? So I just use a single command. Um, I said breaks equals 10. I split it into 10 different, uh, distinct buckets, color, does the color, miles per gallon, and it shows a main equals histogram means that I'm plotting a histogram. What this is doing is it's it's plotting the mileages and their frequencies on, um, so what uh, what is the most common uh, mileage uh, from a given car, okay? And this is the same one in more in density fashion, right? So it's more of a probability uh, density function. And uh, the same thing, uh, and I think I messed up here. So this is not histogram. I think I will fix this and upload this. So there's a, uh, another function called PDF. OK. So, so this, this seems to be very uh, fairly complex syntax. Uh, I'm not going to go into the syntax. Uh, what this is doing is it's plotting, it's comparing multiple, uh, multiple density plots. And this is what it looks like, right? So what, what this do, uh, did was it plotted the mileages of a four-cylinder and a six-cylinder and an eight-cylinder car. So we have these cars with different uh, mileages, and then this is what it looks like. So any insights that you get, uh, let me actually do this. I think I should have included the head uh, here. Mm. So this is what the data looks like. Right. So this is uh, what the, can uh, people at the back uh, read it clearly? Okay. Uh, so what this is, is it, it has a bunch of different types of cars. And the first column is the mileage per gallon, um, which is most likely, I think this is a regression problem. You have to predict the mileage if, you, uh, if I put it that way. So first, uh, First column is mileage per ga uh, gallon. The second column is cylinders, number of cylinders. The third one is probably displacement, I guess. For those who know cars, I think probably is a displacement. Uh, and then uh, horsepower. I don't know what DRAT is, uh, weight of the car. Um, and then uh, so on. There is a bunch of different things. So let's actually form some hypothesis here. <coughs> what do you guys think? What do you guys really think is going to impact the mileage per gallon, what, what is going to matter if you have to? Um, weight. The weight of the car? OK. So that's one candidate. OK. What else? Cylinders. Number of cylinders, right? What else? Displacement. Displacement, uh, OK. Weight. Uh, so weight. Uh, so it, the three candidates are weight, displacement, and number of cylinders. And uh, we will see uh, whether our hypotheses are true or not. So does anybody? Well, um, okay. So I don't know yeah, if this this data. Yeah, it says gear, so I don't know how old the data is. Mean. Yeah. So yeah, so definitely that will impact too. But right. So but in this case, let's take um, the weight and uh, uh, the weight and number of cylinders and displacement as some of the candidates and see which one has the most impact there. Okay. Okay. 
any inside sales, does number of cylinders have any impact based on the distribution here? So what this what this is uh, so um, the blue uh, density plot <coughs> yeah, uh, tells me yeah. that for eight cylinder cars, the 15 miles per gallon is the most likely uh, the mileage that you will get out of an eight cylinder car. Then you have a six cylinder um, car, and 20 miles per gallon is the most most common uh, mileage that you would get. I'm trying to put it in layman's terms, right? I'm assuming that not everybody knows uh, densities of PDFs, right? Um, right. Uh, and then for for a four cylinder car, I think around 23-ish, there's a peak, and there's another peak at 32, right? So do you think it, this finding is consistent with what we just said or what we just discussed? Yes. Sure. And Yes. Okay. Sounds good. Right. So we have we can clearly see um, over here that it's roughly consistent with uh, what we think uh, it should be, right? Yeah. Um, but we definitely see that uh, there are four-cylinder cars that are not so efficient. They are on this side, and um, and there are I think um, some cars that are likely to be. Um, eight-cylinder cars, and they are probably on the more efficient side, right? So if you just use the number of cylinders, which two classes are going to be most difficult to classify? I mean, which classes will be confusing? So if, you, if, you, uh, if you're trying to decide um, whether it's a four-cylinder car um, or six-cylinder car or an eight-cylinder car just based on miles per gallon, which two are going to be most confusing? Four and the six and eight. Four and four and four and no, six and eight is going to be most confusing. I think six is the problem here, right? Well, <laughs> if you so, if you try to uh, differentiate between six and four, yeah. it's still going to be a problem. Well, yeah. And six and eight are going to be a problem again, right? Yeah. Because six is sitting right in the middle. But if you have to do four and six, uh, four and eight, chances are that not many cars will have. Uh, four <laughs> cylinders and then still a mileage of eight cylinder, right? So uh, it's basically, it, it's common sense that we already know based on, um, we have been driving cars, right? So we know that. But uh, it's good to see uh, all that we know in right in front and then just to, uh, see if it makes sense to us, okay? And this is, this is cool, right? And if you go back, this is ugly syntax, right? I mean, this is a lot of work. And uh, when you do it, I think you will realize that it, uh, there was a, uh, there is a bunch of work involved here, right? And I will, uh, so I could have started directly with ggplot2, but you wouldn't have appreciated how, how nice ggplot2 is if you hadn't seen all of this, right? So I just wanted to go through this um, uh, before we get to ggplot2. Um, so, We'll uh, discuss ggplot uh, very briefly. Um, and then we'll not go to grammar structure and strengths and weaknesses of ggplot2 because this is not the intent here. The idea is to just be able to explore features and understand features and see if they make sense to us. Oh, OK, so this is uh, your exercise set for, um, for home. And uh, I will still show the outputs. So you still have the commands. But really, I, ex I will just quickly skim through these. And I, will, uh, I want all of you to actually go back uh, and then try to, uh, try to run these commands and see uh, if, you can, uh, if they give you any insights. Because I will be showing many of these things again with ggplot2, so I don't want to uh, do this twice. So this is a scatter plot. Um, so this is car weight on x-axis. So this is how we do it, right? Attach actually. Um, loads a, a data set in a memory in a way that you can refer to the columns and so uh, it has attached as a, it's an R command. Um, but really if you look at this, uh, the, I'm using the command plot and I'm plotting weight against the mileage. And then uh, main is again, it's used uh, all over R, so you should get used to it by now uh, for giving the main lab label, X label and Y label. And this is PCH is uh, the type of dot that I chose for plotting, and BCH equals 16 is something else, and 21 is something else, so you can just look it up. So um, how to interpret this plot? I mean, can, can anybody give me an idea? 
how do we interpret this? There's more, the car is heavier, the more the gallon. As the car weight increases, the mileage per gallon is getting lower. How about this? What's the difference between this and this? So forget about the lines and the, uh, the straight line and the, this uh, curve, the plus and triangle and circles. Basically, I, I overlaid. Uh, so this, we didn't have any visibility into the number of uh, the number of cylinders, right? But a lot of times you would want to know the segments in your data. Uh, think about this. Uh, so you ship a product in uh, production, and um, people are using that in in, your, in the browser, <coughs> and um, things look okay. Um, but suddenly you realize, um, you look at the segments. You have a Chrome segment, a Safari segment, an IE segment, or some other miscellaneous browser segment. It is entirely possible that the behavior in one of the browsers is different, right? I'm just giving an example. Because, so segmentation is, is it's extremely important when you're doing data analysis. Don't, uh, don't really... Uh, don't really accept um, whatever you have, right? So if you if you think um, uh, you, uh, you have some some numbers that you have, try to slice and dice them into data sets. If it's population, try it by uh, into different young and old um, or gender-based segments or geography-based segments. So try to use demographics or income. So they can be so many things, and it's the same idea, right? So over here, we didn't have any visibility into the different uh, number of cylinders. And in this case, what this uh, a, a valuable insight that we have here is that uh, it turns out that this, uh, so there are some, there are some six cylinder cars that have, uh, so this is, so this is eight, right? So there are some uh, six cylinder cars that have an efficiency as bad as, um, as bad as a eight cylinder car, right? So this is actually giving us more insight. It's not just any random points. We know what category each point belongs to. Does it make sense to everybody? OK. Um, so I will uh, discuss this again in the, uh, in the next plot. But what this is really doing is sometimes you want to do, sometimes you would really want to see uh, a big, uh, a bird's eye view, an overview of how each variable is changing against uh, each, uh, every other variable, right? So in this case, um, any, so this is what we saw just now. And this this uh, plot tends to be confusing the first time when people see it. But uh, if you look at this here, right? So what this means is that uh, if I look at this plot, this is for weight versus D, right? So I will uh, go to the intersection here. and Really, um, so this is weight and this is DRAM. So any any idea if weight is increasing, what's happening to this variable called DRAT? Is it increasing or decreasing? What kind of correlation is this? Decreasing. It's decreasing, right? So we can clearly see that there is a pattern here that this is going down as the weight increases, right? But what about displacement here? Can you see that? So this is weight. And that axis is displacement. What's the relationship there? It's the opposite, right? So when weight is increasing, the displacement is increasing. And I don't know anything about cars. I mean, uh, I really I don't know. I mean, if this should be the case or not. But the data suggests that this is the case. If I go all the way up, now this one is weight, and then this one is mileage per gallon, right? So we all uh, have seen this, that as the weight is increasing, the mileage per gallon is decreasing. And uh, so you'll have to probably start, uh, look at it a couple of times before you can actually absorb it. Uh, OK, so if I look at this plot, does it give me any information about how many cylinders a car has? No, right? And it can be valuable information. Perhaps overall it seems like the trend. But if you consider individual segments, the trend may be reversed. And it's not the case in this data set, but it's entirely possible. Let's look at this. 
Again, this is a package called Lattice. It's, it's another popular package. Uh, and I'm using this here, right? OK, so let's fix something here. So this is for the iris data. And let me actually show you guys the iris data so it starts making sense. OK, so this is what iris data set looks like. So you have the first predictor sepal length, the second predictor is sepal width, the third predictor is petal length and petal width after that, and then last column is the class, uh, the category of flowers, and there is only three unique categories in this data set, okay? And we see only one special, um, sure, I can actually, just the head, right? Yeah, so this is just the head, right? So I can, um, no, if you go and look at it, it's definitely more than that. I can, I think it's not a big data set, so I can probably. Let me. Okay. So you have pretty much. I think they're in the sequence. That's why. Okay. So, so this is the case. Now, if you if you look at, let's take for example this one. So, any volunteers tell me which what kind of correlation this is describing here? So, we will go all the way here, which is the sepal length, and we go all the way up and petal length, right? So, this is telling me uh, there's. Um, it, it's a visual, I'm visualizing the correlation between the sepal length and petal length, right? So if I had looked, assume, I mean, just try to think in that way, that um, you, there is no color here, right? In that case, uh, this whole blob seems to be going in this direction, right? But when you go to the segments, does it, does it give me any information there? Yes. And so what is the information that I get, right? There is a different kind of correlation here versus this blob, right? And I wouldn't have known if I didn't segment the data. I would never have known this. Uh, and that's why um, uh, th this is important. Any other interesting um, things? I think uh, if we look at sepal width and petal length, this one right here, if I didn't look at the colors here, what would be my conclusion? No correlation, right? It's it's the blob is spread all over, right? If the x-axis changes, y is spread all over. But again, uh, if I separate setosa and versicular and virginica, I see a strong correlation here, like this. It's if it, this is if sepal width uh, is uh, if petal length is increasing, the sepal width is also increasing, right? So so you can see that as soon as I uh, segment the data, as soon as I slice and dice the data. The, uh, the correlation and any other insights, they become uh, much more obvious there. And again, uh, so uh, I can, if you guys want, I can actually copy and paste this code, but this is not going to be very productive here, right? So uh, the code is there, and I think uh, you guys can practice that. But uh, I promise, I think I will, uh, when I go um, uh, later on, I will uh, copy and paste some of the code. Just OK. Uh, so this are this are some other examples. You can have scatter plots with uh, the trend lines and regression lines, and the, so this is a very rich plot in the sense that you can, in the same plot, you're looking at the densities along the main diagonal, how the um, how the distribution is changing for mileage per gallon, and you have uh, the regression lines and the fits there. Um, you have uh, each number of cylinders, they are separated. So it's a very rich plot. And again, I think uh, uh, we cannot really spend time on this. But it, this, is, this is giving you a lot of insight. So we are doing all of this to get to the point 
when we are able to actually analyze the, the our goal is to actually get to Titanic data set, and that's why I'm rushing to this. So uh, I will slow down a bit when we get to Titanic, so it, it will make more sense to you. OK? Uh, and this is 3D scatter plots again. The code is there. You can see. It's, I don't see any use for that, but uh, it's, uh, it's uh, you can you can look at it in, uh, if you want to for you know, uh, three variables there. And then this is another one with uh, re a regression plane. Okay. Okay. So we are there finally. 6:40. Okay. So now. So we will uh, slow down here a bit. Uh, so this data set is uh, available. I think you can get that on Kaggle. Uh, and it, it's freely available. Uh, uh, you can download it from different places. Um, so this data, where I downloaded it from, it was a CSV file. Uh, and it was in this, uh, this location. All I did was I said titanic3.csv, and then I was able to edit <coughs> load that data into uh, something that's called a data frame. So you can look at a data frame as a container. It's a variable. It's an array. Um, yeah, for those of you who don't know R, so I think that's, uh, that's how I can describe it. Um, um, you can, I think the closest example for this is a, it's a, just like a database table. So you can refer things by column, by rows, and so on. And then if uh, your data is tab delimited, you uh, do read dot, uh, table, And you can also specify if it's uh, delimited by some other character. OK, so can everybody read that from? Uh, but because now we are talking about really what we, uh, what we wanted to do. We wanted to analyze this data set. So uh, people at the back, can you see this data? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So we have uh, this data set. I will uh, I'm increasing the point of it. Um, so now let's. Uh, now that we are in the problem that we wanted to solve, let's try to build some hypotheses here, right? So based on um, we don't know who survived. So the problem statement here is we want to know who survived. So we we have a so we have some information about all the all the passengers that were on board, and some survived and some didn't, right? So first of all, we will look at the data. We will eyeball it and then see what is it that we have available. We have the passenger ID. We have uh, a flag that uh, tells us whether they were they survived or not. Uh, zero means they didn't, and um, one means they did survive. And then we have this P class, and this is P class is the passenger class. What was their class uh, in, in the ship? And then their name. And their gender, the age, sibling and spouses, how, whether they had any sibling or spouses on board or not, and how many were they. So, and I think this is up to, this variable has a values up to eight or uh, seven. So there were big families on, um, on board as well. And then parents and children. Uh, and then the ticket number the fare, uh, the cabin they were in, and this is the port of uh, embarkation. Uh, um, and I think one was Queensburg, and uh, there was some other Southampton, and third one I don't remember. Uh, so this is the code for all of them. OK, uh, so I want everybody to actually be more uh, proactive here. What, what would be some of the hypotheses? Who is going to survive here? Yes, one. OK, so first hypothesis is the people in the uh, class one, they would survive. And uh, we are assuming that class one means the, the first class, right? So OK. But that's, so, so usually, I, I think uh, um, it, it, this is true in this case, right? But I would caution against that, because when we go to the data, uh, usually what happens is that the person who's generating the data is not the person who's analyzing the data. So don't assume things. Okay, because uh, the person may think that okay, this is uh, uh, the class one in the sense this is the uh, yeah, uh, not in the better sense, right? In the order, I mean, maybe this is what the first class that I thought of. That's hence this is class one, right? So, so it could be uh, first class could uh, be different meaning. So I think it's very obvious in this case, but this these kind of confusions happen when you uh, the person generating the data and person consuming the data is not the same. Okay, so class, what else? 
women. Sure. What else? Age. Age. Yes. Uh, so women and uh, children, right? What else? Location of cab. Uh, I'm sorry. What was that? Location of cab. Location of the cabin, and uh, um, and we don't know that, right? So, but the cabin, uh, if we put it that way, the cabin would have an impact there, right? Uh, so, cabin may have an influence. How about? Uh, so, we talked about the gender, the age. How about siblings and spouses? Yeah. Uh, spouse. <coughs> Any idea? Would it? Uh, so, if you have more people with you from your family. Are you less likely to survive or more likely to survive? Less likely to survive. Yeah, so for, for most decent people, I think you're less likely to survive, right? I think, and it's, it's not a really, um, not judging someone, but I think it's, it's usually the common sense, uh, common sense is that most people, they wouldn't leave their family behind, right? But there are cases, right? So probably men may be left behind if their family goes. So right, I mean, so they, probably that can be a protector there, right? How about parents and children? So if uh, a person has a child or a parent there, are they likely to, is it going to be impact their ability to survive? A possibility, a chance to survive? Sure, but there's a possibility, right? And we won't be able to do all of them. I will just show some visualization there. How about ticket number? No. No. OK, let me go back, actually. How about the passenger ID? So one question is, who assigns a passenger ID? Does it really matter? It just matters if they're unique for each person. Mm -hmm. OK. So in this case, I think passenger ID, it's just a number, right? It's just uh, there. But really, I mean, think about this. Um, let's say with passenger ID is correlated with the cabin. So people, in, in some scenario, the people who came first, they uh, landed in the lower deck versus the upper deck, right? So there can be so many things. But in general, I think the identifiers, the goods and IDs, they usually are student IDs. These are not useful predictors. But you have to be watchful and careful about this. You have to be really uh, cognizant of the fact that you can uh, make a mistake and then uh, just lose some information there. How about the name? I will come back to the ticket. Would name be could name be a predictor, and I, actually I want a show of hands. I think I, I think uh, just just to maybe um, see more energy there, right? So, how many of you think name could be could have an impact on survival? Very few people. And uh, is it fair to assume that people who are not raising their hand think that? Okay. Yeah. You have a question. Uh, Yes. So, mm -hmm. sure. So name name can actually depend. So let's say you didn't have a gender column there for for whatever reasons, right? If you didn't have a gender column, you would actually derive the gender from name. There's a possibility, right? So uh, you will see whether uh, what gender it was. And what if the name has sir or general or something, right? So you you never know, right? So they can, so name actually can have uh, some clues into uh, whether uh, whether it's uh, the person survived or not. I'm not saying it's the case here, but just to give you a general, uh, you have to really think like a detective here, right? So just keep uh, thinking that what is it that you can use uh, here. Okay, coming to ticket number. Based on the discussion, any thoughts? <laughs> Why did you pass up the sex? Because I remember on the show that they said women and children go first. I'm sorry, uh, what was the question? Why did you pass up the gender of the person? Because back then, or usually they say women and children. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't pass that. So I think that was the first thing that we talked about, right? So gender would have an impact, right? So, so definitely gender will have an impact. Uh, and even now, I think. Um, <coughs> It should be the case. I've, uh, so somebody actually in my last presentation, somebody said that I think it's uh, not the case anymore. 
Uh, but uh, as it turns out, uh, so now if any uh, incidents like this happen, it's not women and children who survive most of them, which is, which is uh, sorry and unfortunate, but this is how it is, right? Uh, but, uh, uh, but in this case, Titanic is known to be uh, 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 a case in which uh, it was more women and children who survived than men. Um, okay, so ticket number. Mm -hmm. uh, ticket, uh, ticket may have some indication uh, whether it may represent, I mean, it's a first class ticket or some certain cabin or some, some privileged person, right? So, sure, I mean, it can, it can really um, uh, indicate the topology, I mean, how things were distributed on the cabin. So, ticket may have an, uh, uh, some clues. But really, you will have to explore the features. Maybe A has some uh, meaning, A slash 5, B, C, or maybe only some subset of the tickets. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so the best analogy for ticket number, so like uh, seeing some plane, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, person who's most likely to survive such situation, it's probably next to the window. Mm -hmm. Um, sure, I mean th that's the case. But I mean, if you didn't crash right in the midair, right? So I mean, yeah. if you if you had the opportunity to land <laughs> on water, only on water, right? Of course, right. right? But if you just went all the way to Earth, I think I don't think it makes any difference. But yeah, yeah. But but that, that's a good point, though. Mm -hmm. In this case, if you're using Tick as a proxy for the class. Yes, I mean. Then, then what you really want to look at is class and not ticket. Uh, so these are correlative variables, right? So you have to make sure that you, you don't use two correlative variables because it will give you this false sense of accuracy, right? So, and then that is the kind of analysis that you would do. You would not want to use uh, two variables at the same time that are correlated, okay? And similarly, here may be correlated with the ticket and the cabin and, uh, and the class, right? So there, there can be some variables that are correlated there. Okay, uh, and fair, um, I think, possibly fair. Uh, higher uh, people who paid higher fare, maybe uh, they survived. And then the cabin. Mm, yeah, the cabin here. You're, you're missing some data. Uh, actually, the, so it's only cabin, which is uh, where it is obvious. But there is some other data. I think some ages are missing. Some genders are missing, and then so there are some missing values. So this is a, it's a, it's a relatively easy data set, but it's a, it's really good enough to actually get started. It's not like Iris data set, which is very well behaved, and then you just plot whatever you want to plot. So, but that's a good point, right? So you have also have to, uh, you also have to look at the missing values here, right? So, uh, so that's those are there. For the cabin, um, yeah. Question. About data, so if you run some sort of analysis, you know, yes, uh, you have to. Uh, you have to. Uh, I, I won't be able to do it. I mean, so it's uh, so whatever I'm. Um, uh, if I get into that direction, it, it will take a lot, of, a lot more time. But uh, I think uh, you are going to be by the end of the presentation, you are going to be armed with all the tools that are needed there, right? So you can go home and then try. I mean, not all the code is going to be there, but you can really, when you go home, you will be able to reproduce some of the. Uh, things and actually add in, experiment a few other things. But, but just like a quick thing, so it's just wireless kind of like you run for a function, which is like one, let's say you, it's more or less older than that. Yeah, so one is uh, um, a very strong correlation, like it's like the same, right? Uh, but uh, you wouldn't see that strong correlation, but if it's, uh, if it's strong enough, then you would uh, actually worry about that, okay? Okay. So, so for cabin, I think uh, perhaps C and 85 and C and 123, or possibly B and D and other things. So they they may not um, make any sense. But what if you bucketize them into A, B, and C and D, right? Um, then you can extract features out of that, and that that's a good practice. I mean, you should always be looking at um, um, always be looking at uh, the how to extract more features. For instance, age. So you may not see age to be a good predictor, 
But what if you threshold that in uh, whatever the de legal definition of a child was at that time? And then you create another feature. You say, anybody who's less than this, I will mark them. I will add one more column to that row, and then I will mark that person as a child, otherwise it's an adult, right? And then suddenly you have another feature which may have been lost in the age itself, right? So if you have all the ages, it may not be obvious uh, uh, completely, but as soon as you uh, split that into adult and child, it may become obvious. So are you talking about extracting and prioritizing the, the attributes that you Yes. Uh, so that is Yes. So you, you, sometimes the, uh, you have the data that you need, but it's not in the form that uh, you should have it. So you, you really need to actually, you need to modify it a bit. Uh, you want to extract features out of that. Okay, and it comes from really uh, it comes from intuition when you start uh, solving problems again and again. Then you realize, okay, I, mean, I think it's not that difficult at all. Yeah. This is case of caving, but there are a lot of missing values. So what we should do? We should drop the column. And there are different techniques, right? So you can, if it's a continuous value, you can replace it with median, mean. Uh, you can. Uh, Whatever, if it's a, a classification problem, the average of that class, uh, uh, you can completely get rid of the rows. It totally depends on your situation. If you have, um, if you start uh, removing the rows with missing values, mm -hmm. and you end up with 10% or 5% data, you wouldn't want to do that, right? So you would. It it is really how you. Um, what is your situation, and what is, what is your unique situation? Uh, there's no single answer to that. Could you the question? Okay, so the question is, if you have missing values, what would you do? Do you remove the rows or you do something else? So the answer is, it, it depends. If uh, in many cases you may be able to replace the missing values with the median value or the mean value or the mean value within the, that particular class or you may want to remove the row, right? So there can be many different techniques. Um, you wouldn't uh, want to remove the rows um, if there are a lot of missing values here and there, right? So you don't want to end up with no data at all, right? So because uh, but what if the column is a good predictor, right? So there are values that are missing, but with whatever values there are, it's a useful column. Sure, and the, uh, the, certainly. I mean, there are many things that can be that can be done there, and uh, so missing uh, handling missing values would be actually a detailed discussion in itself. Yeah. Uh, what do you do when uh, number of parameters are so many that you don't know? Uh, are you do Yeah, that's that's a good question, right? So, and this is usually the case, right? So, uh, think about Amazon or Google or um, LinkedIn. When they are uh, suggesting uh, you products or recommending your friends or doing any uh, recommending connections to you, it's not a 10, 12, 30, 40 features problem. They, uh, they go to um, the finest level of granularity that they can get the data on, right? So. Uh, did you come back in last six hours, or last ten hours, or last twenty-four hours, last week? Did you? Uh, are you a holiday shopper or not? Uh, uh, what's your zip code? What's your address? Uh, um, which city are you from? So, right, can you imagine? I mean, the, uh, so those companies, just take uh, Amazon for example. They literally would have thousands and thousands of features, from where they will have to extract the the most useful features to build their. Uh, model. Uh, who should they send out a Prime offer? Who should they send out a, 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 a Kindle offer? Right. So, so who should read this book and not that book? So all of this actually requires um, a lot of lots and lots of features, and, and and that's why really I mean, doing predictive modeling is not uh, it's no big deal, but doing it on scale, that is where things become more interesting and more challenging. And, that's the these are actually the, that is the problem precisely that these companies have solved and then they are really uh, uh, making money out of that. Okay, and the last one is uh, the port of embarkation. Um, so I think there were uh, there are three distinct values there. Okay, um, so what is the data type of each column? So 
i'm showing this because i think this can be a big pain point when you go back home and try to do it because it turns out um so l apply titanic class it just just gives me the class of each column so passenger id is an integer i'm fine with it but survived is also an integer do we really think it's an integer it was zero and one it's really a label i mean we shouldn't call that an integer but r uh, tries to infer uh, based on whatever data uh, was given to r and it thinks it's a, it's an integer but when we are doing a classification problem we have to explicitly cast um, um, the target variable into a um, if it's a numeric variable or integer variable we have to convert it to a uh, categorical variable just to make sure that uh, the classification algorithm doesn't get confused so um, it turns out, and then there are others as well. So when you get this, uh, do this, you will see all the examples, uh, all of these uh, labels here. And simply, uh, you can um, simply cast each of the um, this particular target variable just by saying as dot factor, and then it just converts that to a factor. Okay. Okay. Any thoughts here? Did our, do we think our hypothesis was correct here? No, so we didn't get there, right? So right now it shows what was the proportion of people who died versus survived. So more than 50% people died, but we, it just shows the proportion, right? So how about we add some more color and more, uh, um, no, some numbers and percentages to it, right? So this is all the code that you will use, but this gives you an overview really What's the proportion of people who survive and versus uh, the people who died? Okay, so this is just to get get accustomed to the data set. Okay, and this is just another fancy. Uh, uh, so this is a package called Py3D. So if you are presenting uh, your data and your findings, it's always a good idea to uh, visualize your data uh, nicely. Okay, so let's come to this. We talked about this. We think the gender uh, that gender is a good predictor, and this is all the um, this is some code that will create uh, a pie chart of uh, gender um, and uh, whether they survive or not. Right. So, and uh, again, you can replicate this using the code that I mentioned. Okay. Was our hypothesis correct? So, almost more than more than three-fourths of men actually died, and more than uh, around three-fourths of the women, they survived, right? And this includes children, like uh, female and male, let's call it that way. Okay, so now if I had only one feature here, if I build a model that that just says if it's a male, I mean, I'm, I know for sure it died, right? So it can be a very simple classifier if gender equals male, class equals died, else survive, right? So this is my machine learning algorithm here, right? Just based on this insight. And it's going to be fairly accurate. And how many of you have uh, ever played with Kaggle at all? Okay, I mean, some of you. Okay, so I didn't realize that I would have. Otherwise, I, uh, I would have shown you. I mean, it's very easy to create an account, and then you can just create a model based on gender, and then uh, upload your prediction. Then you can see that it's it's fairly accurate, just based on gender. It, it should work. Yeah. Um, what did the uh, people who didn't have a gender? What, what was their yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out that there was a case, right? So there, uh, because uh, there are some missing values. So we don't know why those values are missing, right? Yeah, did they show any kind of pattern? No, so this is all explicitly only for um, the uh, um, agenda that was identified clearly. Yeah, yeah, so they, they didn't show patterns. Uh, I didn't actually look into that, so that's a good homework <laughs> for you then. It's just, I mean, what you will do is um, you will just replace with this with appropriate filters, like um, gender is not, um, not equal to male and not equal to female, so you will yeah. you will have, or I think it's, uh, you can simply look for a missing value and that should also give them all, because there are some missing values there, okay? Okay, thanks. Yeah, but that's a very good point. I mean, we should actually look at that as well. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so this was a, a good enough predictor there. 
How about age? We agreed that age would be a predictor, right? So, so I'm using this uh, summary of age. Summary is a, it's a function in R, which gives you a, uh, I think this is a seven point summary here. So it gives you the minimum age. Um, and so they have ages in this. I think they have somehow normalized the age in this uh, uh, fashion. And you have the first quartile. So um, uh, first quartile is about 25% of your data. So 25% of the people were under the ages of 20. The median age, like right in the middle, uh, was 28. The average age, the mean age, was 29. Uh, and then third quartile, uh, third quartile is 75%. So 75% of the people were below 38. And there was someone who was uh, uh, 80 years old as well, right? And then there is uh, the missing values are 177. OK? Uh, and we go to OK, um, so what about, uh, what if we, what about, uh, what if we segment the age by survival, right? Uh, so we want to look at the summary of ages only for the people who survived and only the, uh, for the people who didn't survive, right? So I'm trying to segment this and see, uh, is there any difference in age uh, in uh, the distribution when it comes to um, whether the survived or not, right? Uh, and I'm going to be using uh, box plots that you have seen, right? So, so the, on the so on the left, so we have uh, so this is actually uh, the age distribution. Um, I think I should have. Let me actually show you on my screen here. I think I again didn't copy and paste this uh, summary statistics here. Let me do that. Okay, so this is the people who did not survive. And then if I just to do change this to one. Any insights? Or um, I think uh, an, an understanding that there's no insight here is an insight itself, right? So the oldest person survived. The, um, the person. What is that? The oldest and the youngest person survived. <laughs> okay, uh, the oldest and the youngest person actually survived. Yeah, that's that's a good insight, right? So, can everybody follow this, right? So, uh, one insight that I, I didn't notice that, by the way. <laughs> because I know the oldest. Yeah, I know, I know. But uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very uh, good observation here, right? So, the one observation here is the people who were uh, the person who was the youngest on the ship. And the person who was oldest on the ship, both of them survived. Because uh, the min and max are there. And the min and max for the people who died is, is greater than that. right? So th that's a good, good observation. What else? The medium is the same. Any other yeah. insights? Just even if it's wrong, I mean, just There's roughly think about No correlation. No correlation, uh, OK. <laughs> uh, so because the median age in both cases is about 28, the mean age is uh, they are close. I mean, yeah, so the people who are slightly older, they the died, mean, but... The median wouldn't change, would it? But it's the median of that particular growth, right? It, it may or may not change, right? So I agree, right? But it's the median of that particular growth, so it may change. And we have the third quartile uh, in the died. Yeah, I mean, slightly older people there. But really, I mean, it, there's not much here. It doesn't tell us anything. But we... We had this hypothesis. We said that age has a has an impact on survival rate. So what's going on here? Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. So any any more specific yeah. What about the combination of factors like age and class? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's entirely possible. But we just uh, uh, we discussed this. Our hypothesis was that age uh, will have an impact, right? But we, over here we see that there's not a very strong impact. Yeah. Yeah. 
Also, uh, that's 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 a valid point. There is a lot of missing information. Okay. What else? Yeah. Exactly. So, what's uh, what should we do here? Okay. So, do you do you think if we have uh, if we because uh, when we say age has a uh, age will have an impact, we are not talking about any age. We are talking about children here, yeah, right? So, gender was there, but when we talk about age, it's not just any age. But when when you are looking at this, it's just it's an aggregate, right? So we have to find a way to actually separate children and um, yeah, and adults, right? And then we may want to create another column or another category that actually sets this threshold. If age is less than this, then it's a child versus uh, it's a uh, it's an adult. Okay. Okay, so we looked at that, and these are again some box plots. Uh, the left, uh, the uh, left by the, the, I'm leaving that for you to just uh, just uh, to, uh, think about this uh, for your homework. But this is uh, the age distribution by gender. Uh, let me zoom in. Uh, so this is the age distribution by gender, right? So. On average, men were um, um, uh, the median age for men was slightly higher than uh, women, and the circles on the top they are outliers. So they were some very old men as opposed to women. So uh, women were um, relatively younger, but men they were some very old men who were on board. And this is uh, this, those bubbles actually signify outliers there. And then we have uh, age distribution by survival, uh, and it looks like the median age for surviving people was um, uh, was um, was lower. But I will let you guys actually do this uh, as a homework because we still have a bunch of things. Again, try to build a histogram. Try to look at the density there, and I'm, um, so this is all that you can do at home. There's some. Some interesting insight here. So, okay. So we have this kernel density plot. So this is the distribution of ages by survival. So the red one is the distribution of people who died versus the um, green one, the, uh, the age distribution of people who survived. Any insights here? Does do the two look, look different? Okay. Yeah. How did you get people with negative ages? Uh, so this is a PDF, right? So it's it's a smoothing function that would take you to the to the less than zero, right? So that's a very good point and good observation. I'm happy that uh, you were paying attention. But really, what happens is that when you're fitting a density function. Uh, you can have a lower value as well. So it's, it just signifies that um, that smoothing that happens on the left. OK. What, um, sorry, what was that? When you're estimating densities, you can pull the restrictions of the values can't be lower than zero, right? So yeah, it, it is a density and it can be less than zero. Uh, so the, there can be values that are less than zero, right? Somebody is taking an extra pair of children. Just a minute. I can't? Uh, why would you want to do that? Because I mean, it's uh, so you you are uh, so you are actually uh, impacting the way the smoothing is going to happen, right? So you're going to uh, shift this uh, this key piece of information to the right, right? So this is somewhere over here, right? Does it tell you anything? There's a there's a bump there. What this all shows is that. This age is Baby. this Save age is high probability age, and suddenly there's a blip, and then it goes. Save the kids. kids. These are kids, most likely very little kids, right? Um, I don't know what age, but it, it, the data is right there, right? And again, we, we can always slice and dice it. You don't want the artifacts to smoothing function. 
Uh, it can be an artifact, but that bump is there, right? So bump bump clearly shows that there was. Yeah, so that that is an artifact, right? So and we agree, right? So the the negative value is the artifact, but that bump is there based on data. And we don't want to mess with the smoothing function because we will we will shift this, okay? So this actually is some evidence there that age had something to do with uh, with survival, okay? Does it? Make sense? You have to keep going. So this is a uh, code for data splitting, and uh, I'm not going to uh, go through this again. But whenever you are uh, um, a novice mistake when you are doing predictive modeling is when you you train the data on the, the data set, and you test on the same data set. So uh, it is going to work, right? But uh, it's a good practice to randomly partition your data into uh, different partitions. And you test on, uh, you train on one partition and test on another partition. Otherwise, if you are, it's just like you're making your algorithm memorize and until it just, just memorizes your data completely, um, you're just keep, going to keep on uh, training, right? So, so this is the code for partitioning your data. And uh, you can uh, take a look there. Um, OK. So uh, I'm going to just try to just be very quick. We have a lot of material uh, that uh, is left. So now, um, so this is uh, ggplot2. Uh, this is a very uh, nice graphical package. And the data set that I'm going to use here first is uh, to, uh, to introduce us, uh, the basic things. And then I will go, come back to titanium. So this is diamond's data set. And uh, so this is the carrots and the, uh, the cut. And cut has, I think, five values, the color, the clarity, depth, Table. Um, I don't know what table there is. I don't know what depth is, but some of the other things probably had some idea. X, Y, and Z. No idea what this is. These are some numbers to me, right? So, uh, so what would have an impact on on the on the price, for instance, right? If you are trying to predict the price of uh, your um, of a diamond. Okay. So, does it does the histogram look any different? Uh, in terms of like uh, the, the, uh, the way that histogram looks. So this time I used, um, instead of uh, the base uh, histogram function, I'm using the ggplot uh, histogram function. And the way ggplot is, is um, if, so this is actually, So ggplot actually renders things in layers. So, so this is the first layer. What I'm saying, what, what I'm telling the, my function is that I'm going to plot this data set, and the next layer is saying that I want to build a histogram, and it's visibly better than what uh, what we drew, right? I mean, our histograms they didn't look that nice. Similarly, if I go to the density density function, so this is the first layer here. I'm again saying that uh, this is uh, this is uh, the, the plot for this data set, and then we this is the second layer, which is telling it that uh, okay, uh, on x-axis, plot the the carrots. The values are going from zero to five, and then fill it with gray color, right? And it's uh, once you start doing it, I think it should be intuitive. And this is a this is a scatter plot for carrots, and if I look at this. So again, this is the first layer here. And first layer is saying that uh, plot ggplot for data set diamonds. And on x-axis, plot carrots. And on y-axis, the price. Any correlation between carrots uh, and price? Right? So, so it's obvious, right? So uh, with increasing carrots, I uh, think, uh, so the price is roughly on the higher side, but uh, not too strong. But what if I want to know? Um, what if I want to know uh, the correlation by color? You remember there was a color com column uh, in there, right? And so this can be misleading here. That, so this color refers to the column, and this is a parameter that I'm passing. So this is a parameter, and this is a column, right? So uh, uh, there were different colors. We don't know what colors those were, but they, these are different color values, right? So now we have been able to um, plot them separately. All of the, uh, whatever colors those were, right? So the color D, E, F, G, H, I, J, the whatever colors those were, uh, we were able to uh, segment them. Even nicer, 
right? Um, so what this is, uh, what we are doing, uh, trying to do is that we are plotting all the segments separately, just just slicing and dicing the data until we understand something, until we get something out of it. And it's just literally, I'm just uh, two or three commands that I'm using, and just uh, installing a package, and then we are done. Um, okay, can there be more? Yes, <laughs> even more. So look at this. It's beautiful, right? I mean, so you have carrots and you have price. You have within each category, you have, uh, I think, fair, good, very good, and premium, and ideal was the quality of cut, right? So, and then um, um, there was another variable. The first one. I think there was some uh, there was some imperfection metrics uh, there, uh, um, a metric there. So uh, now, I mean, you can uh, if you look at this. If I look look at the first row. It's basically a four, uh, if you look at it, it's a four-dimensional plot really. I mean, you are adding uh, more and more dimensions there, and you're uh, slicing and dicing your data to the, the greatest detail that you can, right? Okay. And Titanic data again. Okay. So uh, what do we have here? Um, we have, if we look at this here. So what we are doing here is uh, we have. Y is fair, right? So this is fair. And X is P class. So this is P class and this is P class. And then we have, a, we are doing a box plot, which is for different ports of embarkation. Is it different? And uh, the first one is actually missing value. If you look at the first one, there's no value here. And this one is. Uh, Queens, Queensburg, I guess, and this is South Southampton. Do they look different? Visibly different, right? So we can see that uh, um, um, the people who um, boarded from uh, so there were few people from Queensburg, and uh, and then uh, definitely uh, the people who were at uh, from Southampton. They, it's, um, I think, it looks like that this. Um, there is a lot of outliers here, and I don't want to get go into the details. I think we are uh, short on time, but it just gives you that idea that how 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 you can, you can slice and dice data uh, when um, uh, with R. Yeah. And um, let's uh, see this one. This is okay. So now uh, it is um, fair and survive, right? And I actually created a column, adult and child, and then male and female. So look at this. I mean, how how many? So this, uh, if you look at this plot, this is uh, basically whether the person died or survived, only for male and only for children, right? So this comes, uh, it's male, child, survived, uh, died or survived, and then again that is for male, adult died or survived, and then you can really slice and dice data there. Okay? And there is, uh, just try some variation. I mean, uh, you would be surprised how, uh, I mean, once you start uh, uh, doing these different variations, you will see how, how insightful and how valuable this is. So, so basically, all you have to do is that with the blue um, here, so replace any uh, numeric variable there because we are doing a box plot, and uh, type any categorical variable and then any categor uh, categorical variables here, and try to play with this, and then you will see how patterns will start emerging there. OK, uh, let me actually uh, directly skip to really uh, random forest, and I will show you this for just to I wish I had more time, but <laughs> this is a lot of data to be covered. So, so I'm using the package called random forest. Oh, okay. So it says uh, it doesn't could not find a package called random forest. So I'm doing. Okay, so it's on my desktop, I guess. So, 
So really, let, let me, I think, in the interest of time, I'll just Miss the E in forest. Oh, OK. That's the bad problem. OK. Okay, so I want to make a point here because uh, we, we had some observation, observation there. So I want to actually uh, make a point um, before we move on because this. Uh, so I can actually let's go back and uh, print. Okay, so a quick point to note here is uh, you guys remember uh, that so this is a confusion matrix. So, uh, so what this shows is how many of uh, their uh, cytosas were classified as cytosas. So it's 50. How many of cytosas were classified as virginica, uh, versicolor? Zero. And virginica. But if you look at how many versicolors were classified as versicolors, it's 47. And there were some of versicolors classified as virginica. And at the same time, four of the virginicas were classified as versicolor. And then this is some of them were classified as, um, as a wrong class. Does it ring any bell? I mean, did, did, we, did we notice something when we were analyzing features back uh, early in the presentation? We saw some overlap there in the distributions. So definitely, these two classes are likely to be confused with each other. Right. Okay. Uh, what I will do is I will send all of you the slide deck uh, because I really quickly have to show you um, how you would do this in Azure Machine Learning Studio. And uh, a Titanic example. Um, uh, once you ramp up on this, you can actually uh, try to do it uh, yourself. There. So I can quickly. So you can use random forest for regression, for classification, for clustering, for getting the importance of the variables. You can do that. Um, so all of the data is there. And then this one is a neat one. What this shows is that you can actually also get in, um, variable importance, uh, how important a variable is in getting the classification. And what this shows you is that, um, so these are two different criteria for uh, getting uh, the variable uh, importance. And uh, so this shows the first criteria says the weight is most important, and second one says that the displacement is most important. So it actually turns out that uh, this uh, our intuition was correct. And then there is some other data that we have uh, and some resources. Okay, so I will quickly jump to. So this is uh, a new uh, tool that Microsoft released recently, and it's, it is neat, really. So what you can do is this tool actually lets you upload your data set. Um, it's, uh, it's machine learning as a service. So you, uh, you want to uh, do some, uh, uh, do some uh, classification or regression or any other machine learning task. So it has a bunch of different algorithms which are already there, right? So you have, so this is some of the standard data sets that you already have. You can play with these data sets. You have uh, uh, different for data format conversions. You want to convert data to different data uh, formats. You can do that. Data input or output, you can read data. And you can really read data from any web source. You specify the URL and you have the data. It's uh, loaded there. <coughs> then you can do different transformations of data, different kinds of filters. And I love this this thing because if you uh, I I did the splitting and partitioning code I left it there and um, the ugly code that uh, there just to just to convince you how the useful this thing is because this thing just neatly I drag and drop a partition sample here I will connect my data set to it and I choose uh, what kind of sampling I got and what kind of uh, what rate of sampling. And then if I, let's say if I choose 0.5, and then I run here, and it is, I don't know where the machine is. It's a high compute instance, and it's running in the cloud somewhere. And it will give me all the, all the things really that I need. Does it take the algorithms to each 
Uh, absolutely, absolutely, and uh, we'll get to that. Uh, okay, so okay, so this is, and this is. <coughs> This is my data set after partitioning. So I have 446 rows and 12 columns. And before partitioning, I had 891 rows, 50% sample, right? Uh, in 12 <coughs> columns. And uh, then <coughs> I'm using a decision uh, to class uh, this uh, random forest. But there is a bunch of other uh, machine learning algorithms. So you have a bunch of machine learning algorithms. There's a long list of machine learning algorithms. And you don't have to do anything. You just maybe be fine tuning the parameters. And uh, you have clustering algorithms. You have regression algorithms. And I mean, it's really, uh, it's, it's a lot of things. And then even if you have a big data set, it, yeah. What is that? Yes. Yeah. So there is something called the R module. Uh, so really, uh, what you can do is, you can create your own R module, and uh, you can execute R script, uh, script. And you can create the module, and then you can nicely define the input and output, and then uh, you can create your own module really in R. And I heard the news that the Python is coming next. Uh, is it true? So I think very soon we'll be releasing a SDK, which will let you basically use the .NET framework to code up your own modules. Yeah. So an SDK will come out soon. Yeah. So yeah, it is. Uh, uh, so you pay by use, right? Right now, I think they have a promotion, hundred twenty-five dollars credit per month. I don't know, but uh, I'm using I'm using it for free. For uh, I'm, I don't use it a lot, uh, in the sense that I the the free tier is enough for me to actually just do all the. Uh, <laughs> so um, I wish there was more time. I mean, this is neat. Question: How many publish? So you did this. How many publish? The, uh, publish the as in Oh, so you mean uh, how can other people use it? Well, number one, if it's your final result, how do you present it to the business users? Number two, oh, okay. you so you can you can dump that, and you can download, you can dump uh, the data set, you can save it as a data set, you can save the output, and the neat thing is you can publish this as a web service within a few clicks, right? So you. You built a model, and now you can let anybody else out there use that through it as a web service. So that's that's the feature there. And I think I have already scheduled that uh, talk, and probably I will be doing this. Uh, this is neat. I mean, it's uh, you can think about this uh, as uh, Apple, the way they disrupted the uh, marketplace for uh, uh, mobile apps. Now this is something that anybody can build their machine learning model and then publish it. And then really make money. I mean, if they are good enough, they can just really publish that and then let people use it. Um, okay. Uh, you go. How well supported is the documentation and tutorials? How is this pretty new? Uh, so documentation is catching up. Right? So I, I think there, that is one thing that uh, needs some effort there. But uh, eventually it will catch up. And if you are, uh, if you know, uh, if you have a reasonable background in um, machine learning. It will actually, um, you know, I think uh, you will be able to uh, use it. So uh, for instance, this is my Titanic data set, right? So I just created, uh, uploaded the data set, and saved that, created, uh, uploaded the CSV file, and created the data set. And, uh, and look at this. Uh, so previously, what we were doing was we were running all of those commands to get the uh, get all the box plots and histograms, right? So right now, there is only two options here. So I can get, um, so histogram for survived doesn't make any sense, but uh, let me actually get the histogram of some other metric like age there. And uh, so let's get, uh, so this is a distribution of age, and uh, I can also get a histogram of age here. So we have, uh, okay. so we get a histogram here, okay? Um, and then it, you guys can really explore that. Another neat thing about this is, I copy this, and 
this bit here. Okay. So this is, I'm creating another experiment here. And when I created this experiment, I want it to be a bit different. I don't want four decision, don't want four decision trees, I want six decision trees. I just changed this. And so quickly I was able to replicate the experiment with the, uh, um, with the different parameter. And then what I will do here is I'm going to, so this is going to show me how, and it's, it's a small data set, I think it should just, so it's queued right now, it's gone, and uh, it will, so it will uh, check out a machine uh, somewhere in the cloud for me, it's, uh, it's a high compute instance in case I need uh, a bigger data set. I don't know what's the underlying logic, I mean how do they decide uh, if I need a, really need a high compute instance or not, but so the right now check shows that the random uh, class decision process has been initialized. Now the model is training. And uh, did anybody notice in the new run, uh, the left side is already check, 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 right? If I have to run my code again, it would run again, no matter what, right? So right now these decisions are saved, uh, the, the left um, workflow, it was already saved in the cloud. And uh, it didn't need to run again. And now I have this here. And uh, this is another one. I just trained another, uh, I trained and evaluated another, another model. Yeah. The schema, when you're reading from the databases from multiple databases, do you have to do rework before or is it? You have to specify what's your target column and I will get to that. That's a good observation, right? So this shows me my rock curve, right? And usually I would be calling another function for doing the rock curve, right? So this is giving me a rock curve. So this is random guess, and this is the score data set. And this is a precision recall, and this is left. So there is uh, all the metrics here. So uh, true positive, false negative, uh, false positive, positive. So this is the confusion metrics, the accuracy, the precision, the F score, the recall. I mean, uh, it's just happening uh, within a, a, a blink. I can also compare two models uh, here, right? So this one, okay, so I think I can do this, and this will actually compare two models, which one is better. I can do that, one, right? And it will plot the rock curves on the same, uh, on, on the same um, scale, and then it will show me, because I can immediately tell which rock curve is better than the other, and then it's uh, right there. Is anybody waiting outside for us, or because I can actually, uh, no? What are the uh, costs associated with this um, So for me, I think it's, uh, uh, if I recall correctly, because I'm in a program called Biz, Biz Prop now, but if I remember even before that, uh, this, uh, it's, so do you know what's the pricing for this? I think 125 to up to $135, uh, uh, you can get a credit. But I think my limit is higher because I'm my limit might be 200 because of being in the uh, in their business uh, program. So new, basically, if you are a startup, you can go and apply. By the way, so any startup would get that uh, into that program. But for individuals, I think it is 125 dollars because I'm I don't work for Microsoft, so I don't know what exactly is the case. How about students? Uh, so you may have if your uh, your school may have a partnership there with them, uh, so you can really uh, check with your school or figure out. <laughs> Uh, both, both. So uh, I can be having my workspace, and then what I can do is once I'm done, I can go ahead and save that workspace and, as a, my production workspace, and then expose that as a as a web service to production. Yeah. And you mentioned that you got some slides. How is that possible? Are you going to post it on the Meetup webpage? Or uh, so this thing? Yeah. 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 Uh, so I think uh, this is not uh, going to be posted in slides. This is something I can maybe send the URL. Uh, go uh, sign up for a free account. If you don't use it, you don't pay anything, right? So just go and sign up, right? Uh, uh, Unless so you kick off a job in this uh, IGO machine. No, I mean the PowerPoint that shows just now. Uh, you said you're going to email us the slides. Uh, do, we, do we give you, like, my business card or something, or what? 
Um, no, so uh, I'm, I'm not going to email. It's going to be uploaded on the Meetup page. Uh, oh, oh okay. uploaded in the Meetup page. Uh, yeah, and, and I, I will send out an email through Meetup as well. It, it's just in the Meetup page, that's all. So that's why I get Yeah, advice. because I mean, I don't want to spam everybody, right? So, I mean, it's, uh, okay. so if, if, um, if you need it, you can download the slides, otherwise uh, it's not in here, right? Yeah, I'll so, uh, so coming back, uh, so the, uh, your uh, production, right? So, so you can deploy that uh, as needed. So it's both for your prototyping and uh, all the things, right? So let me know if I, somebody is waiting outside because this is this is actually some fun uh, stuff here. Um, look at the samples, right? So you don't know, right? So you don't need documentation really here uh, if you have these samples. Oh, by the way, let me actually go to. Uh, yeah, it's a public review. It's not a final product yet. Okay, so we have uh, this workspace here, and uh, I wanted to show this thing. I this time I'm comparing two models. So for those who want to leave, I mean, yeah, uh, uh, they are welcome to leave. I think people want to be held up here. Okay, so if you look at this, both models are roughly um, performing the same, right? The rock curves are almost overlapping here. Um, and then um, we have uh, the precision and recall for both of them here, uh, the accuracy, and then um, a, a bunch of other metrics that are there. And I was uh, actually going to the samples. So they have a bunch of samples here. Uh, so some regression examples, some binary classification examples. Um, let's um, let's just open one of them. So so this is a very well known data set. It's got uh, UCI again from UCI repository. Uh, so th they have a missing value scrubber, right? So and you can. Um, <coughs> You can choose a custom substitution value then, right? So you can. Uh, uh, my browser is not behaving. But uh, so. Oh, okay. I see. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So it should be a copy of it, right? It should happen. So I saved this. And now if you look at this, um, now I can replace with mean, I can replace with median, I can replace with mode, replace and remove entire row. So it's again mean, right? I can do this. Um, I can uh, do a whole bunch of other things here, right? Then I have uh, this reject columns. I, will, I can split the data. Uh, I can initialize the model and train the model, store the model. Uh, there, is a th uh, there is some. There is a recommendation, uh, some recommendation engine uh, examples too. Uh, let's go back here. Yeah, movie recommender. Uh, so, so that's there, and you can see that again. I have some movie rating database, and then again split, um, train recommender, um, a score, uh, a score the recommender, and then. Um, you can do do a whole bunch of things. Really, I mean, it's uh, uh, once it goes out, uh, once they uh, fix the minor uh, pain points here and there, uh, it is going to be something extremely useful for uh, people to get started. I mean, um, so really, I mean, if you want to get started and you are beginning to actually uh, do some machine learning, it's a uh, it's a very useful tool. Yeah. Okay, so. Yes, yeah, sorry. I mean, uh, the la last time I think what happened was I was I tried to go slower in the beginning, and then um, and then we had a lot of material remaining. So at least I, I rushed, but at least I finished. So, um, but uh, if you are really interested in this slide, deck would help you figure this out. Yeah. Uh, that's my question. I'm grateful that you're making the slides available, but could you also make the slides for your previous presentation? I think I did. Yeah. I think I did.
I did upload and sent out, in, uh, sent out an email. Uh, if there is any of them missing, let me know. I will double check it. Uh, and then this, this, this is going to be a, there is going to be a bit of cleanup. Uh, I will uh, do them in the next couple of days. Um, any other questions about uh, any of the topics? Anything? Yeah. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.